And we are looking live. Welcome, everyone. Today is Monday, March 15th. Uh, welcome to the House Economic Matters Committee. We have a voting session today. Uh, we're on voting list number 12 first. We have some alcohol bills we need to take care of, starting with House Bill 529, St. Mary's County Delegation. Is this you, Robert? Yes, it is. House Bill 529 from St. Mary's County. We've got, it's a local bill. No amendments, no opposition at the bill hearing. And we have a letter from the delegation. Uh, this would authorize the uh, local board to issue a distillery on-site consumption permit uh, for a certain fee uh, for St. Mary's County. Sounds good to me. Is there a motion most, for favorable? favorable? Is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, Thought I heard it. Um, without further ado, Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Uh, Delegate Brooks. Aye. Delegate Fisher. Aye. Delegate Queen. Yes. Delegate Turner. Aye. Delegate Rogers. Yes. Delegate Carey. Yes. Delegate Jackson. Yes. Delegate Pippi. Yes. Delegate Mao. Yes. Delegate Wilson. Yes. Delegate Impolaria. Yes. Delegate Branch. Uh, I didn't yes. hear you, Delegate. All right. Delegate Valderrama. Aye. Delegate Walker. Yes. Delegate Chi. Yes. Delegate Adams. Yes. Delegate Arents. Aye. Delegate Fennell. Yes. Is your bill HB 870? Delegate Charcutian. Yes. Delegate Howard. Yes. I'm on voting right now, man. Is that your Delegate bill? Crosby. Yes. Delegate Watson. Yes. Motion carries. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. It's eight, yeah. If hey, any John, lobbyists you... are listening, do not call the members voting. <laughs> <laughs> it's readily apparent. <laughs> um, motion carries. Let's go to House Bill 814. The House Bill 814 is the other St. Mary's local bill. Uh, this is one of the bills this year that authorizes or actually requires the local board to refund the annual fees that were paid for certain alcoholic beverages license. We have a letter. Mm -hmm. There was no opposition um, at the hearing and there are no amendments. Move favorable. Second. Moved and seconded for favorable for House Bill 814. Uh, any discussion? Yeah, Mr. Chair, real quick, is it possible? Oh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Go on. Is it possible to get that amended to a St. Mary's County delegation bill? The only reason it wasn't is because Delegate Morgan got it in late. It's not a big deal. Just no. Curious. We're not okay. allowed to amend amend bills, do sponsor amendments. Okay. <laughs> That is just part of the rules for this session. It's not a Chairman Davis rule or ECM rule. It's just a House rule. Gotcha. Um, Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Uh, Delegate Watson. Yes. Delegate Crosby. Yes. Delegate Howard. Yes. Delegate Charcutian. Yes. Delegate Fennell. Yes. Delegate Aarons. Aye. Delegate Adams. Yes. Delegate Chi. Yes. Delegate Walker. He's frozen. Del Delegate Walker's frozen? Yes. Sweet. Okay. Yes. Delegate, that was a yes, not a yes, mm. he's frozen. Delegate mm -hmm. Valderrama. Aye. Delegate Branch. Yes. Delegate Impolaria. Yes. Delegate Wilson. Yes. Delegate Mouts. Yes. Delegate Pippi. Yes. Delegate Jackson. Yes. Delegate Carey. Yes. Delegate Rogers. Yes. Delegate Turner. Yes. Delegate Queen. Yes. Delegate Fisher. Yes. Delegate Brooks. Yes. 
Motion carries. Uh, House Bill 1240, please. House Bill 1240 is a Frederick County bill and it prohibits a stadium license holder from selling beer and wine out of styrofoam containers. We have a letter of uh, support from the delegation. There was no opposition at the hearing and there are no amendments. Move favorable. Favorable. Second. Uh, any discussion? Does anyone wish to be recorded in opposition to the favorable? Hearing none, all present voted aye. How about House Bill 1242? House Bill 1242 is a Frederick County bill and it establishes a beer and wine permit um, and a beer and wine and liquor consumption permit in Frederick County. Uh, the Board of License Commissioners may issue these permits to people who already have Class A licenses, and both permits authorize the holder to allow for on-premises consumption, although a person may not take an open container from the premises and cannot and the license holder cannot serve open beverages through the drive through We have a letter from the delegation. There was no opposition, and there is no amendments to this bill. Move favorable. Second. Moved and seconded for favorable for House Bill 1242. Uh, does anyone wish to be recorded in opposition? Seeing none, hearing none. All present voted aye. May we go to House Bill 1270, please. Okay, House Bill 1270s, also Frederick County. It increases the maximum amount of beer, the holder of a barber shop or a beauty salon beer and license um, may provide to a, to a customer for on-premises consumption from five ounces to 12 ounces. We have a letter from the delegation in support. There was no opposition and there are no amendments. We move favorable. Second. Moving to second it for favorable for House Bill 1270. Does anyone wish to be recorded in opposition? Seeing and hearing none. All present, voted aye. Uh, last bill on the list, House Bill 1272. Okay, House Bill 1272, also from Frederick County. It increases the maximum percentage of alcohol by volume for wine that class three wineries and class four limited wineries holding a class A wine license may sell from 21% to 22%. The bill also increases the maximum percentage of alcohol by volume that a restaurant holding a class B beer, wine, and liquor hotel or restaurant license may sell from 14.5% to 22%. We have a letter from the delegation in support. There was no opposition to this bill at the hearing and there are no amendments. Move favorable. Second. Anyone wish to be recorded in opposition? Seeing none, hearing none. All present, voted aye. That concludes all the bills for House Bill, I mean, for um, voting list 12. We will now go to voting list 11. Uh, what do we have on here? Uh, House Bill 69. House Bill 69. House Bill 69 prohibits a food service business from providing single-use food and beverage products to customers unless the customer asks. The bill also prohibits a lodging establishment from providing personal cleaning products in small plastic bottles unless the customer asks. Um, there are two sets of sponsor amendments to this. Um, also, this bill was on um, the voting list last Monday, but it was held. So the amendments um, strike the hotels from the bill provide that the bill doesn't apply to food and beverage products that are provided at drive-throughs or food beverage products that people use to serve themselves or lids, um, adds delivery to the type of service that may not provide single use food and beverage products to customers, authorizes a business to apply for up to two waivers of up to three months each in compliance, if compliance will be a hardship and provides that if at least three months after the first warning of food service violate, um, a food service business violates. It is a civil penalty of up to $500 per violation, but not more than one penalty within a seven day period. And um, the second amendment actually 
the Second Amendment requires a food service business only to keep a supply of plastic straws on hand as opposed to utensils, stirs, lids, and condiments. Um, we talked yes. about this a bit with the subcommittee chairs, and I think that the sense was even with the amendments that we would move unfavorable. Second. Yeah, th that one's on me, guys. I I'm not going to let anybody else. It, it just seemed for me, and, and I definitely respect what the delegate is trying to accomplish, but it seems like an awful lot. What's that saying about the juice not being the whatever, juice and squeeze, it, however that goes, it sounds like one of those situations. I'm not sure. I mean, we're not actually prohibiting anything with the bill. You, it's sort of like, ask me nicely, that kind of thing, and, and you can get it. It just, and considering the plastics we've already done on the floor this year, I, I that's where I was coming from. So, I, you know, that this is on me if, if you know if we end up going that way it just seemed to me we mr. Chair, well i'll um, let it be mr Chair, i reached out to the uh sponsor and explained you know the situation to her i had been trying to work with her with this bill she does understand um she I, again i personally don't want to penalize her for the asking versus demanding and i'm very i, I was very you know i'm very happy with the direction she was going. So maybe, you know, in another time, obviously, but I told her, you know, the appetite to move so many of these big bills was, you know, not there. So uh, she does understand. Now she was I mean, If I'm wrong, I, I mean, I don't want to, you know, prejudice yeah. the committee if the committee feels differently than by, by all means. Well, the question, Mr. Chair, I want to ask because she asked the wrong person. She asked if it was better to withdraw it or to, um, I, and I, I don't know. She said in some committees, uh, uh, an unfavorable looks worse the next year than a withdrawal. I personally never cared, but so I didn't want to give her any advice. I'm not sure what uh, she she didn't know which would be better or if it would consider being negative if it was uh, moved unfavorably for an, in another year. That never, to, I'm with you on that. That doesn't matter. To me, the only difference really is if you want to protect your batting average. Yeah, she that, said she didn't that, care about that. Yeah, okay. it, it, just because we vote one way it's nobody's bound or or at least that's not how i look at it i agree thank you mr chair delegate charcuterie thank you mr chair i just want to speak for a second on why i think the bill is really helpful is that you know we're trying to figure out how to shift our habits and um so i think there's a time and an appropriate time and place to um to ban things. Um, but in this bill, by making it so that we have to ask for stuff, I think part of what it's trying to do is make us all aware of like, we can still get access to any of it. So we're not banning anything, but all of us have to think about, do I need plastics? Um, you know, whatever the plastic is, a straw or, you know, um, a fork, whatever. Um, and so I do think there's a value to, um, you know, I think there's a value to to this kind of an approach that helps us shift our habits uh, when, when we're doing takeout. So thank you. Delegate Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, uh, I mean, I know that this is probably going to be favorable, which is great, but I, I sure wish that that some could stand in the, the shoes of my brother, Scott, who owns two restaurants and has just been pilloried for the past 12 months. And then here we are discussing this, which I just don't get it. Um, it's like tone deaf. It's like, I, I just don't understand after what has happened to his restaurants and so many others, how tone deaf we can be to even consider something like this. So while I appreciate Delegate Charcutian's comments, um, it would be helpful maybe if she stood in his shoes for 12 months to find out what he's been through. And, um, and I think that'd be helpful. Thank you. All right. We have a motion for chair briefly. Uh, uh, Delia Wilson. Very brief. I apologize because I just want to clarify, you know, um, and just in the, the defense of Delegate Love, when it, when going over this bill, her goal was, you know, actually to make it as harmless as possible for the restaurants. In fact, hoping that they may be able to save money by not having to give these out unless asked. So I do believe in this case, Mark, uh, you know, that this was one of those things that was definitely taken into account that while it might may have been I guess the word would be troublesome as far as to learn something new and change. It definitely would not be a, it should not have had a financial impact on the, um, on the restaurants. If anything, I was hoping that it would 
um, change some habits and possibly save them money because they wouldn't be given this stuff out unless it was asked. And I don't want to drag this on, Mr. Chair. I just felt that was a point of clarification that may be needed. Again, that was the attempt. No, I mean, nobody's not dragging anything on. Uh, it, it's worthy of conversation. They all are. So if we have something to say, I certainly want to hear, hear from everybody. Um, but if not, we'll, um, if, no, if there's no additional comments, we'll start with the unfavorable motion and see how, how that pans out. If not, we'll entertain a different um, motion. Madam Vice Chair? Yes. Uh, Delegate Watson? Courtney, I'm you. Is Delegate Watson with us? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Uh, Delegate Crosby? Yes. Delegate Howard? Yes. Delegate Charcutian? This is on the unfavorable? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, no on the unfavorable, thank you. Delegate Fennell? Yes. Delegate Aaron? Yes. Delegate Adams? In the words of Courtney Watson, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Delegate Chi? No. Delegate Walker? Yep. Delegate Valderrama? Aye. Delegate Branch? Yes. Delegate Impolaria? Yes. Delegate Wilson? Yes. Delegate Mouts? Chairman, I'm giving this one an absolutely yes. Thank you. Delegate Pippi? Yes to the unfavorable. Delegate Jackson? Yes. Delegate Carey? Yes. Delegate Rogers? No. Delegate Turner? Yes. Delegate Queen? Yes. Delegate Fisher? Yes. And Delegate Brooks? Yes. All right, motion carries. Uh, House Bill 106. <clears throat> House Please. Bill 106. House Bill 106 requires the Office of the Attorney General to maintain a website where consumers can report robocalls and other spam calls, uh, provide advertising on how consumers can identify robocalls and report them, and um, requires the OAG to notify the Federal Trade Commission of each report that it receives through the website regarding a robocall or other spam call. Um, so this bill was referred to the Banking and Consumer Protection subcommittee where it received a recommendation of favorable with, with amendments. The subcommittee's amendments require an annual report to gather certain metrics on the robocall robo reports received and strikes the requirement that the OAG advertises and rather requires the OAG to establish and promote an education campaign on what robocalls are and how to report them. Move the amendments. Second. Moved and seconded uh, on the amendments. Uh, Delegate Adams on the amendments or on the bill? On the bill. Okay. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed nay. On the bill as amended. Motions move favorable as amended. Second. Second. Delegate Adams, then Delegate Watson. Um, it, Mr. Chairman, just to be very brief, we had a, a very good uh, briefing on this in the you know, subcommittee, and I, I think I might not be reading between the lines when the uh, Attorney General seemed lukewarm on this uh, bill. It sure, surely puts a responsibility on their department. And think about this. When people call the Attorney General's office, it's not just to complain, it's to receive uh, satisfaction and, and action. And unfortunately, what we're doing is we're... Uh, putting the obligation on the attorney general to receive the complaint, but there's no mechanism to actually do anything about it. So I'm going to vote no on the bill and um, stand with what I, you know, I, I think the attorney general's office was not vocalizing opposition, but I think they have concerns. Understood. Uh, Delegate Watson. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Did we, uh, did we review amendment number four? Did I miss that? But can you read 
Amendment number four is uh, study. She yeah, mentioned, I said yeah, the report. she did say something. Okay, I said so I just, sorry, I missed that. I just wanted to point that out and ask, make sure the committee looks at what that is asking for because there may be other things that we didn't think of, but particularly Delegate Wilson, you wanna make sure you take a look at that. But to um, Delegate Adams' point, was it Delegate Adams that just spoke? I think so. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think we believe that if we can at least get this information collected, which is not that hard to do when you have an online form, that it may it may show us what trends are happening in Maryland and may point out other areas where the attorney general's office could be effective. And so that's why we sort of turned it into this, um, this type of reporting mechanism. And I just wanted to make sure that you looked at it all and if there was something that's missing, we could include it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Delegate Impolaria, then Delegate Pippi, then Delegate Walker, then Delegate Wilson. Yeah, um, I have to agree with Delegate Adams that, let me tell you something, you know, while robocalls are a nuisance, you hang up on them. End of story, you hang up on them. You can even block them. But the, the amount of fraud that we're now dealing with through the internet and even with our um, unemployment insurance, it's just over the top. Over the weekend, three people called me they were told they, they owed money back to the unemployment insurance. They hadn't even received money from the unemployment insurance. So I think we need the attorney general to do the job that he needs to do at the moment, not feel good things. So I'll be voting no on this. And yeah, it's it's a nuisance, but I get robocalls. And I, when somebody doesn't say something within the first three or four seconds, I just hang up because it's a robocall. Or I know it's a computer calling for someone to speak to me. So, you know, if people feel that they're not capable of um, hanging up, maybe we need to give a class to people that you take your hand and you put the phone down. And that would solve a lot of this problem. So I'll be voting now. Delegate Pippi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, we, I mean, we talked about this in subcommittee. And one thing that I, I did find out is that they have a website with drop down a menu for different issues that people could come in contact with. So. There's not currently a drop down for robocalls. I, I guess I'm just wondering if, if this is something that, you know, they can just do without having us to like force them to do it. Um, and I, I hate to, to pass a law to force an agency to create a drop down and look into it. And it, it kind of seems like, well, I do want to address the robocall issue, but I guess to Delegate Adams' point, you know, they, he did tell us they really can't do anything about it. Um, if we could collect information, I'm just, I don't know. Uh, that, that's kind of where I'm at on the issue. Uh, Delegate Walker. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just trying to make sure I heard correctly. Uh, rather than having any teeth to the bill, did I hear that the Attorney General is required to educate the public about robocalls? Correct. How are you going to educate somebody about a robocall? Not how to report them. How to report them. But then, so if that's the case, so what we're, what we're passing now is not doing anything towards those companies doing robocalls outside of what the federal, you know, what the federal guidelines are, right? Neither but, the original bill. Yeah. So... I, mean, I, I completely disagree with Impolaria. Robocalls are a nuisance. It's uh, over and over again. They're getting more and more creative. They can have a phone number that looks exactly like your number, you know, calling from the same. Mine is 523, and they'll, they'll call me from 523. I wish we'd have kept the teeth to the bill, but uh, is there somebody from the committee or subcommittee can justify why we lightened it up, you know, so much? I don't think it's lightened up at all. I think it's got more teeth than it did. No. So the only thing um, in regards to what you're saying, the only thing that's changed is it said um, advertise like print media advertisements. And so instead of advertising, because that's going to cost some money, what the is what the OG said, OAG said, um, we said promote and promote um, an education I don't remember the word that I use, but in education campaign. 
campaign, thank you. So that they can do that in ways that aren't going to cost as much money, like just from the material and getting them out and things like that. And on the website. Yeah, and on the website. And there's everything else that was in the bill at the beginning is still in the bill. Nothing was taken out of the bill. And then we also added a requirement, um, a reporting requirement. One more job we won't do. I heard the reporting part. Tiffany, can you read to me that part about the education of the amendment that we voted on? Sure. So it says establish. The last part of the amendment. The last part of the amendment. Okay, it says establish and promote an education campaign. One second. Okay, informing consumers on how to identify robocalls and other types of spam calls and report robocalls and other spam calls to the office. Uh, all right, thank you. All right, uh, Delegate Wilson, Delegate Mouth, and then Delegate Queen. Uh, get Aaron's. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. I just want to say, first of all, I think it all, it's almost comical to hear my colleagues say that this is just a nuisance. It's well known that robocalls bilk the elderly consistently out of money. And the problem is they don't know it's not the IRS calling because somebody gives a badge number. To make light of this is, again, comical. It's almost as comical as the AG saying they don't want to take charge of something because every time they come in here, it's to ask for more responsibility and more things to do. I'm not minimizing this issue at all by saying that there are other there are other crimes to be investigated. Yeah, they all need to be investigated. The simple fact is doing nothing is helping not a damn thing. Saying right now that, well, they already have a drop down box. How's that working? At this point, if you ask any of your senior citizens, how do they report a call? They will answer the same way mine do. They don't know. It's very important. I know there's not a lot we can do until we start digging and find out what we can do. But at least with the amendments, I appreciate you guys doing it. At least it salvages and asks the question, well, what can we do? And we don't know what we can do yet because we don't know what information we have. Again, it's almost offensive to hear that this is not not an idea worth looking into when the elderly get taken advantage of every year. You may be smart enough, you may be wise enough to not answer these calls, but there are a multitude of people when they hear it's the sheriff's department, when they hear it's police, when they hear that it's IRS or FBI, they're terrified. And all they want to do is get out of trouble. So please have a little empathy for somebody else who may be losing money or losing something very important because of a, a call that we may be able to stop them from getting. Thank you. Jesus Christ. Uh, who was next? Was it Delia Mouts? Yes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I was just trying to make fun of the way uh, Delga Wilson ended his comments, but... No, I'm, I'm all, yeah, 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 CT, or Delga Wilson. I, I am, Chairman, I am all in on this. I can't agree with Delga Wilson more. Um, this is, uh, you know, years ago, uh, colleagues, the FCC said they were cracking down on robocalls, and all of a sudden robocalls stopped for a little while, and it's at epidemic levels. And the Attorney General certainly can do something about this, and nothing's going to happen until somebody says something has to happen. And um, I'm just glad we've got the bill. I hope everybody votes for it. It's a huge problem. Um, I, I, senior citizens is one thing. Businesses can't operate because their phones ring all day long with, uh, with, uh, with robocalls. And the schemes are smarter and better than they ever were. And until we do something, um, it's just it's ridiculous that this can be allowed to go on, especially when people are out running their business and doing things the way they're supposed to be doing and, and, the, and the phone system in your own homes turned into the wild west. So whatever amendments we put on it, whatever we can do, we got to do something. Thank you. Delegate Queen. Yeah, I just want to be quick on it. I don't want to belabor this. We talked about this in our subcommittee. We talked about both sides of should we do something, should we not? And the consensus was that this is a significant problem it's targeting certain people, mostly our elderly. They are being told that uh, you know they need to provide money, send money here, and all sorts of issues. The attorney general does do some effort in that area. If you're not familiar with that, I have invited the attorney general to my uh, 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 community to talk about various frauds. And one of the ones when they talk about frauds related to seniors is about scam and robocalls. 
what we did with the bill to add the reporting is to provide the attorney general more information about what the where's the source of the call. Are they targeting particular uh, demographics so that they have more information to provide to the FCC and to see again, um, are there, is there more education type things that they can do? So um, I went in with this bill thinking we didn't need it, but I came out uh, listening to both sides and thinking this is a strengthened bill and we should uh, vote on it favorably. Thank you for your time. Uh, Delegate Ahrens. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess I'm on both sides of this bill myself. It's just a, one of my biggest concerns with the bill is, is that the Attorney General's known about this for quite some time, and he's done nothing. They've done nothing on it. And my biggest fear about the bill is I think we need to hold people accountable with this, but I would rather see something in line of if we had a solution for this moving forward, because this is going to be looking just a lot like unemployment to me, where we're going to get a thousand calls now that we put something into on paper and ink to say you, we have a vehicle to help you with this. When there is absolutely nothing the attorney general has done in the past on this other than gather information. And I just uh, I just don't think we need another um, mark like that after experience all the things we've done with unemployment. I'll vote for the bill if people think it's gonna do something, but I just think we're opening ourselves up to saying, gee, they did something great. They say, we'll now take reports on something we've known been a problem for how many years and the attorney general has not been able to do anything for us over the last however four or five years that we've known this. So that's where I'm at, thanks. Uh, Delegate Adams. Thank you, Chair, my, my point without standing on a soapbox, is that we had a Republican delegate out of Frederick County, Kathy Asali, bring a bill a few years back. It was a spoofing ban. And the, the conclusion is that it's uh, FCC. It's regulated federally. So, so the point of my observation is not to diminish anyone's interests or rights. And I'm certainly not going to stand on a soapbox on this particular issue. I'm simply saying that uh, the legislation it creates a website. It's almost like it's trying to create a website to get the federal government to handle the postal service better. Uh, we have no jurisdiction in that regard. So we can complain all day long. The question is, can the attorney general literally do anything about it? And the answer, and, and that's asked and answered. He can't. The federal government can. If we want to appeal to the federal delegation to do something in Washington, uh, sign me up. Delegate Watts. The bill requires the attorney general's office to report the, uh, the reports of these calls to the Federal Trade Commission. So the attorney general's office can pass these reports on and, and hopefully that will be the beginning of us trying to get the FTC and the federal delegation to focus on this. So there is something they can do and it is to use their bully pulpit to report these claims to the FTC. Anyone else? If not, the motion on the floor is for favorable as amended. Um, or did, did we adopt the amendments already? Yes. yes. Okay. All right, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Delegate Brooks. Yes. Delegate Fisher. No. Delegate Queen? Yes. Delegate Turner? Yes. Delegate Rogers? Yes. Delegate Carey? Yes. Delegate Jackson? Yes. Delegate Pippi? No. Delegate Mount? Yes, please, yes. Delegate Wilson? Yes. Delegate Impolaria? No. Delegate Branch? Yes. Delegate Valderrama. Okay. I'm sorry, Delegate Valderrama. Aye. Uh, Delegate Walker. Yes. Delegate Chi. Yes. Delegate Adams. No. Delegate Arendt. Yes. Delegate Fennell. Yes. Delegate Charcutian. Yes. Delegate Howard. Yes. Delegate Crosby? Yes. Delegate Watson? 
Yes. Uh, motion carries. Uh, House Bill 168 is basically, uh, um, what do you call it? A reconsideration Applicative. of Delegate Turner's bill. I think that was 221. Correct. Um, so since we acted upon that one. Um, this would conflict no with that. Conflict. So move unfavorable. Second. Moved and seconded for unfavorable on House Bill 168. Uh, does anyone wish to be recorded in opposition to the unfavorable motion? Seeing none, hearing none, all present, voted aye. Uh, House Bill 174, please. House Bill 174 was taken up by the Public Utilities Subcommittee last week and it was recommended to be favorable. There are no amendments. Both favorable. Uh, move favorable. Second. Moved and seconded for favorable on House Bill 174. Is there any discussion? If not, Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Delegate Brooks. Yeah. Delegate Fisher. No. Delegate Queen. Yes. Delegate Turner. Yes. Delegate Rogers. Yes. Delegate Carey. Yes. Delegate Jackson. Where is Delegate it? Jackson? Yes. Delegate Pippi? No. Delegate Mouts? No. Delegate Wilson? Yes. Delegate Impolaria? No. Delegate Branch? Yes. Delegate Valderrama? Aye. Delegate Walker? Yes. Delegate Chi? Yes. Uh, Delegate Adams? No. Delegate Arents? No. Delegate Fennell? Yes. Delegate Charcutian? Yes. Delegate Howard? No. Delegate Crosby? Yes. And Delegate Watson? Yes. Uh, motion carries. Uh, House Bill 220. Um. House Bill 220 <clears throat> from Delegate Adams uh, was heard about a couple weeks ago now, and this is the one that would replace the RPS system with an auction for clean energy attributes. Um, move unfavorable. Second. Uh, moved and seconded for unfavorable on House Bill 220. Any discussion? If not, Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Delegate Watson. Yes. Delegate Crosby. Yes. Delegate Howard. No on the unfavorable. Delegate Charcutian. Yes, on the unfavorable. Delegate Fennell. Yes. Delegate Aarons. No. Delegate Adams. No, sorry, no. Delegate Chi. Yes. Delegate Walker. Yes. Delegate Valderrama. Aye. Delegate Branch. Aye. Delegate Impolaria. No. Delegate Wilson. Yes. Delegate Mouts. No. Delegate Pippi. No. Delegate Jackson. <sighs> yes. De Delegate Carey. Yes. Delegate Rogers? Yes. Delegate Turner? Yes. Delegate Queen? Yes. Delegate Fisher? No. And Delegate Brooks? Aye. Uh, motion carries. <clears throat> what was that? Uh, House Bill 332. 
Uh, House Bill 332 was taken up by the uh, Public Utilities Subcommittee, recommended unfavorable. Move unfavorable. Second. Second. Move to second it for an unfavorable on House Bill 332. Does anyone wish to be recording opposition? Yes, Mr. Chair. Delegate Charcudian. Anyone else? House Bill 332. Hearing none. Seeing none. All present voted aye. Wait, except uh, for me, right? Correct. I beg your pardon? Except for me, not all present. You got me as a, I'm against the unfavorable on removing. Yes. You did, okay, thank you. Yep, no, all others present. Okay, thanks. Uh, House Bill 613, please. Uh, House Bill 613 is the bill, local bill from Prince George's County uh, that would uh, shut down coal and gas fired power plants uh, in the county. Uh, there was an amendment to make it only prospective. Move unfavorable. Second. Moved and seconded for an unfavorable on House Bill 613. Any discussion? Um, if not, does anyone wish to be recorded in opposition to the unfavorable motion for House Bill 613? Seeing none, hearing none, all present voted aye. Uh, House Bill 829, please. House Bill 829 establishes a loan loss reserve program in the Department of Commerce, which is intended to incentivize lenders to lend to small businesses that may otherwise have trouble obtaining financing. There are four amendments. Uh, the first three are sponsor amendments. The first amendment strikes the $10 million mandated appropriation. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. A second. Awesome. What was the first of first four amendments? So there are three sponsor amendments and one technical amendment. I just what, read the what first. What do you mean by sponsor amendment? The sponsor sponsored it or it's adding names to it? No, no, the sponsor sponsored it. It's, oh, okay. It's the sponsor's amendment. Oh, I thought you meant people were asking to sponsor it. No, sir. Okay. Okay. Get so it. the first amendment strikes a $10 million mandated appropriation. The second amendment authorizes a borrower to pay 0% into the fund if the lender so agrees. The third amendment strikes a special section providing that it is the intent of the General Assembly that $50 million of federal funds be deposited into the program. And the last amendment is technical. Move the amendments. Second. 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 All in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed nay. Uh, motion the on the as bill as amended. Second. Yes, move the bill as amended. Second. Uh, moved and seconded. Delegate Howard. So this is basically the bill where we're lending money, taxpayer money to small businesses. And if those businesses go bad, we back up the bank at a certain percentage of, with state funds. Well, it I depends, don't think so. It depends ahead, on I'm where sorry. the money is coming from. So right now there's no mandated appropriation. So there's right nothing, now. yeah, there's nothing in there. So um, I think the intent is that once um, federal money does come in that it'll be funded through that. But um, yeah, it's, there's, no fe there's no state money right now. Where would that federal money, if it were to come in, where would it normally go? I mean, I, there's, no, there's no pot of money that it's supposed to come from. It's just, if there's federal money available then right. hopefully it will that, federal, no, that federal money would normally go into the general fund, correct? I mean, I, it's not specified where it's going to come from. There was a section in there that said that the $50 million of federal funds from coronavirus um, would be put into there, but she struck that. So there's, there's nobody, nobody saying it's, you know, specifically where the money is going to come from right now. I think right now um, they're just establishing so, the program for when there is a money, money available that, that. And that, that gets me to my point when there is money available, 
that money would normally flow right through to the budget, correct? It, it could, if it's coming from federal, yes, it, it could. Okay, so it would go to other programs that we ho really holistically need in Maryland desperately. Okay, cool, thank you, Mr. Chair. Anyone else? Delegate Queen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think for clarity, I want to understand, my understanding is we don't have this money coming in federally now, and we're trying to, when it does come, which we anticipate it coming, we have a vehicle for where it could be used. This is not like we're taking current money that federal government's giving us for the general fund. We're not taking anything away. It's, that was my understanding and my incorrect. We're just taking future money. Future money, which is designated, yeah, future money that would be designated to help small businesses. Right, in other ways, okay. Could be, but this is the way we would like to use it, correct? is the way some people would like to use it, but yes. Some, that this particular bill wants to use it, correct? You are. <laughs> uh, Delegate Mount. Delegate Mount? Yeah, sorry, Chairman. I was having a tough time with my mute button. I'm kind of, as Delegate Impolari, he's back on. He just texted Yes. Me computer died. So I was stalling for him a little bit too, but I guess I don't have a question on the bill. It's more just to kind of explain my opposition to the bill. And, and that's sort of, this kind of plays out in the small business world where the government picks winners and losers. And it, on the one side, yeah, I can see how this program would help um, certain small businesses. But on the other hand, um, you've got other small businesses that are struggling to survive. And they're doing everything they can do. And then the government comes along and lifts up new businesses to compete with those small businesses. And it's the way the government gets involved in the private market, the small business market that creates all kinds of disruption. Um, and it actually winds up hurting some of those existing small businesses who um, we didn't really have a chance to hear from. Stuff like this, they're not really aware of it until it shows up on their corner and um, it creates um, enormous hardship. Um, it helps, it does help those businesses that apply for these, these uh, benefits, um, but it also has an impact on, on other existing businesses. And so I'm not willing to uh, lend my support to, 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 to offset that balance. I, I believe in the, in the market, so thank you. Uh, Anyone else? If not, um, there's a motion and a second for favorable for House Bill 829 as amended. Madam Vice Chair? Yes. Uh, Delegate Brooks? Yes. Delegate Fisher? No. Delegate Queen? Delegate Queen? Where is she? She's muted. Yes, yes, yes. Delegate Turner? Yes. Delegate Rogers? Yes. Delegate Carey? Yes. Delegate Jackson? Yes. Delegate Pippi? No. Delegate Mount? No. Delegate Wilson? Yes. Delegate Impolaria? No. Delegate Branch? Yes. Delegate Valderrama. Aye. Delegate Walker. Yes. Delegate Chi. Yes. Delegate Adams. Yes. Delegate Aarons. Yes. Delegate Fennell. Yes. Delegate Charcutian. Yes. Delegate Howard. No. Delegate Crosby. Yes. Delegate Watson. Yes. Uh, motion carries. Uh, House Bill 875. Uh, House Bill 875, as it came in, uh, removes uh, certain kinds of uh, wood byproduct from the renewable portfolio standard 
There's an amendment from Delegate Davis uh, that would instead make it a uh, specifically take black liquor out from tier one. Uh, that's the same posture as a Senate bill that we already have in our possession from Senator Kelly. Move favor the amendment. Second. Second. Uh, Delegate Fisher. Just a quick question uh, for Mr. Chairman. Is this bill now in the same posture as Delegate Buckles or is it completely no, different? No, uh, Delegate Buckles is completely different. Thank you. Yes, sir. Delegate Aarons. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, the, the big thing I have with this is, and I think I mentioned this in a previous bill hearing, we were talking about black liquor and how we buy so much of our renewable energy and it is black liquor from Virginia. And I'm just concerned that this bill is going to take us a little bit faster, a little bit quicker. If we start getting rid of this and how we control it, we're just going to raise rates without thinking about that. We're already buying so much of it in Virginia, and that seems to be okay. But yet we're trying to eliminate stuff in Maryland that's costing jobs and taking people out. Um, I, I, and that's been kind of a theme I've seen with our, our renewables. And it kind of just bothers me and troubles me as, as somebody looking at the the fact that we're spending so much and we're asking people to buy so much and we're raising rates on everybody that can't really afford it. I, I you know, I mean, I, I've been suggested that I see that uh, there was an amendment offered earlier today and somebody sent something in the email. And then there was another one talking about maybe extending this out a couple of years. So people can plan. Mary coming from what is it, Domitar or, or somebody. Here's the real Public. assumption that they're making is that if we don't, if we don't use black liquor, then the, al the alternative compliance payments are just gonna go up and that we can't replace these with wrecks from someplace else. I, I think that's a dubious claim to, to, for them to, to try to make. Um, and they came to the game really late. I just started hearing from them about Friday on, on, on their concerns and their offers of amendments uh, I mean, they did testify at the public hearing. I'm not saying that, but these amendments, unless I'm mistaken, the first I heard of them were Friday. But even with that, here's the thing, as I, I would say that internal, uh, I mean, in-state job, the only reason why, to be blunt, this bill didn't pass years ago was because of Luke Mill. I mean, there was no other reason, and it was for that reason to protect jobs. Once Luke Mill went away on its own, back in 2019, summer of 2019, the argument that we had sort of went away. I mean, that what's really going on now is out of state companies and, and on not only out of state companies, to be honest, out of state unions as well. Everybody, you know, so it's on both sides. One of the few times I would say labor and, and business are on the same for the same reason. It's about out of state jobs and out of state money it's really not about Maryland. And so that's, as I saw it, um, that's where the fight was coming from. But we held out for years. The, the first time I remember this bill, it was around 2012 or 2013, I think Delegate Johnny Oshesky may have been mm -hmm. had that in. Um, so we're talking nearly a decade. And it, like I said, and the sole reason why we did not act on it was because of Luke Mill and Luke Mill still went out on its own. And then we heard, oh, well, there's a bias. Something's going to happen. That was 29th, the summer of 2019. We're rapidly approaching the summer of 2021, and we're still being told, oh, something could happen with the jobs or something. And I, I just don't think it's about th that, you know, that, that plant and so forth. I really think it's about both management and labor outside of the state of Maryland um, they have a vested interest in being able to sell those wrecks. I guess you're right from both a job standpoint outside of Maryland, as well as the company with money. I mean, that's making money from selling the wrecks. And while I can respect that from their point of view, uh, you know, the, bluntly that it, it, for me, the only reason why I supported it previously was because of the benefit to Marylanders outside of the borders you know, that's Congress's or somebody else's responsibility. I really don't worry about it. Um, so that that's why I was moving on it. That's not to discount anything else, but that was my rationale, um, uh, a Delegate Aaron. Okay. 
I just think we're spending a lot of money and we're building up economies and we're taking stuff away from our own jobs and here in the state. And I don't, I don't think that was ever the goal. I don't think that's something we should be jumping up and down about. And, uh, you know, I, I, I will say this point. is consistent with the governor's cares bill from last year. He had that in as well. well <laughs> that, that doesn't make any better for me, but I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Cares bill was huge. <laughs> Thank you. I tried. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Delegate Charcuti. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Delegate Aarons, I just want to make sure uh, this may not change your opinion, but right now all of these wrecks are going out of state. Like, there's not a single black liquor wreck that we're selling to an in-state plant, right? So that's um, I think that's a really important piece. There's, you know, there's of wind wrecks, some are in-state, some are out-of-state. I agree with you. I'd like to see more in-state wrecks, but the black liquor, there's not a single one that's that's being sold in-state. So when we take this out, we're only taking out out-of-state wrecks. So I just want to make sure that's, that's clear. I think um, I'm focused on the back jobs, but thank you. I appreciate it. Sure. And then the other thing I just wanted to say, I also got some of this, I'll, I'll generously call it creative math from um, opponents uh, to this bill today. And I just wanted to bring folks attention to something. First of all, we have several groups that officially advocate for ratepayers in this state. One is the Office of People's Council and the other is um, a number of advocacy groups that advocate for ratepayers. And I think you know we ought to take with a massive shaker of salt when the company that gets these Rex is advocating theoretically worried about ratepayer impacts and none of those groups are advocate are, are raising the issue. But more importantly, if folks are at all tempted to believe the math that came from the folks who stand to keep these wrecks, um, I just wanted folks to, I wanted to point out that in the PPRP report that our DNR, DNR's PPRP did for us last year, they actually looked at this question about whether or not um, taking black liquor out would make a difference um, in the pricing. And the thing that they point out is that black, li this, is, this is from their report, um, black liquor, however, has a small 1.5% of all qualified recs in and declining market share in PJM, and therefore it exerts minimal influence over rec prices or the ability of LSEs to meet the RPS requirement. So what that means is even though it's a big share of our rec market, our recs are traded in the PJM market. And because we're the only state that takes black liquor recs from everywhere, the fact that it's 25% of ours doesn't mean it's a big part of the rec market overall. So when we remove it from ours, it's not gonna have a big impact on the supply and demand. And this seems to say it's really not gonna have an impact on rec prices overall. So while it'll make a big difference in cleaning up our RPS, it shouldn't make too much of a difference in, um, in affecting the rec prices. And I'm happy to chat more with folks who, you know, if anyone's concerned about rec prices and what this might do to it. Uh, Delegate Mouts. Just a quick question, Chairman. Does this, do the amendments make this bill now identical to the Senate bill? Yes. Thank you. Did I miss anybody? If not, um, it was- uh, Move favorable with amendments. I don't remember if we actually did that. The, amend the, the amendments were not adopted. Okay, All move right. the amendments. I second, I second that. All right, all in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Is there a motion on the bill as amended? Move the bill as amended. Second. second. Moved and seconded for favorable as amended on House Bill 875. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Delegate Brooks. Yes. Delegate Fisher. No. Delegate Queen. Yes. Delegate Turner. Yes. Delegate Rogers. Yes. Delegate Carey. Yes. Delegate Jackson. Yes. Delegate Pippi. No. Delegate Mouts. No. Delegate Wilson. Yes. Delegate Impolaria. No. Delegate Branch. Aye. Uh, Aye. Dele Delegate Valderrama. Aye. Delegate Walker. Yep. Delegate Chi. Yes. Delegate Adams. No. Delegate Aarons. No. 
Delegate Fennell. Yes. Delegate Charcutian. Yes. Delegate Howard. No. Delegate Crosby. Yes. Delegate Watson. Yes. Uh, motion carries. Uh, House Bill 876. House Bill 876 is a workers' compensation bill that extends the sunset for a change that the General Assembly passed last year in the assessment amounts for two agencies, the Subsequent Injury Fund and the Uninsured Employers Fund. Um, the workers' hey, Laura, can I jump in for just a second? Yes, sir. Is this the bill we don't need because it's not, we will have another legislative session to determine if they are actually bankrupt or, or no, what do you call you it? Will uh, have, uh, you will have several, more than several. So we, we could take this year off from this bill. Is am, and Can I correctly interpret that? Yes, sir. Move unfavorable. Second. Uh, does anyone wish to speak to that? If not, does anyone wish to be recorded against the unfavorable for House Bill 876? Seeing and hearing none, all present voted aye. Can we go to House Bill 890, please? House Bill 890 was taken up by the Public Utility Subcommittee. Uh, as it came in, the bill did two things. It raised the monthly possible charge under a stride plan for natural gas infrastructure replacement. And it also uh, talked about how the uh, charges are worked into base rates over a multi-year plan. Uh, the amendment strikes the fee increase uh, and simply leaves the multi-year rate plan. The uh, subcommittee moved it favorable with amendment, recommended favorable with the amendment. Uh, move the amendment. Second. Delegate Howard. On the bill. All right. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Is there a motion on the bill as amended? Oh, the bill is amended. Second. Second. Delegate Howard. This is the bill we were talking about that you, Mr. Chair, were talking about. It's basically the same money as they're collecting it through stride, whether it's a line item or within the base rate, correct? Yes. Well, let me rephrase. Let me rephrase. Uh, Delegate Howard, let me rephrase what I what I said on that. What I was saying was that it's the same money. It just depends on when you get it. Do you get it up front or do you get it after the rate case? But either way, you're still paying the same money. That, that and then, was the point I was making. And in the first stride, how did the PSC want that structured? And how does this differ? If I'm, I'll let Bob speak to it. I think at the beginning, I'm not sure that they were in favor of it at all. But Bob, do you recall? Initially, they were not in favor. Uh, of course, at that point, they were also doing uh, traditional rate cases where you had have a single test year that would be used for developing the rates. Uh, now that they've gone over to multi-year base rates, sorry, multi-year plan uh, in accordance with the bill that... Uh, you pushed forward and they eventually saw the way you want to do business and agreed that multi-year rate plans are, are appropriate. Uh, this changes the way by saying every pushed, time- Bob, you every, said I pushed a bill forward that- had, No, I didn't say anything Delegate about Davis. you, Delegate Howard. Chairman Davis. Oh, okay. No, Delegate Davis had a bill to uh, require PSC to adopt one of a couple of multi-year uh, rate plans. And although that bill did not succeed, over the next summer, they in fact went through a rulemaking themselves and adopted the ability of a uh, utility company to ask for a multi-year rate plan. Uh, so the gas companies have done so. And so what this bill does, uh, this essentially talks about every time the gas company asks for a rate adjustment, they'll be moving projects over from stride, which is forward funded back mm -hmm. into the base rates where it is uh, part of the regular, uh, the regular assessment as opposed to the stride assessment. And instead of being looked at on a yearly basis, it's looked at through a multi-year. Correct. Pretty much says it for me, thank you. 
Uh, anyone else? If not, Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Delegate Watson. Yes. Delegate Brooks. Yes. Delegate Crosby. Yes. Delegate Fisher. No. Delegate Howard. No. Delegate Queen. Yes. Delegate Charcutian. Yes. Delegate Turner. Yes. Delegate Fennell. Yes. Delegate Rogers. Yes. Delegate Aarons. No. Delegate Carey. Yes. Delegate Adams. No. Delegate Jackson. Yes. Delegate Chi. Yes. Delegate Pippi. No. Delegate Walker. Yep. Delegate Mount. No. Delegate Valderrama. Aye. Delegate Wilson. Yes. Delegate Branch. Yes. And Delegate Impolaria. No. Uh, motion carries. Uh, bill 1012. House Bill 1012 is the bill that, as introduced, requires employers providing airline catering and airport food, beverage, or retail or other consumer goods at BWI to offer jobs that become available to qualified laid off employees. Um, the bill establishes related notice and record keeping requirements, protections from adverse action, and a civil action for employees, um, and various requirements for the Maryland Aviation Administration. There's a set of amendments in the packet that makes a number of changes to the bill, um, including removing the requirement that a subsequent owner uh, become subject to the bill. So someone who buys a company, they would not need to comply um, with the amendment also strikes a number of the responsibilities for MAA, um, including a reporting requirement. Uh, I would move unfavorable. Second. Moved and seconded for an unfavorable for House Bill 1012. Any discussion? Does anyone wish to be recorded in opposition? Mr. Chairman. Sir. Excuse. Yeah, I like. Uh, I would like to abstain. Abstain or be excused. You may want to be excused, sir. Be excused. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to be uh, recorded in opposition to the unfavorable. Anyone else? If not, all others voted aye. Uh, House Bill, listen, guys, we just heard this last week. I brought this before us, not, not to vote just yet, but I wanted to have some discussion to get a, a, a sort of maybe a feeling if I needed to send it to subcommittee or, or whatever the case may be. So I, I would ask council that if you could just briefly uh, touch upon 1171 and hope, you know, I can get a little feedback and decide if, if I need to send this to subcommittee or exactly how we're feeling about this. Okay. So this is the bill that prohibits an employer, including units of state or local government from terminating an employee solely for refusing a COVID vaccine. And then in turn, uh, a, an employee who refuses to get a vaccine that's offered or available to him or her is uh, waiving a right to file a civil action in court for um, getting COVID in the workplace. And the bill would sunset at the end of 2023. Uh, any thoughts? Yep. Howard? Yeah, I mean, I like the bill. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I don't know anybody 
a damn explanation on anything, on how I defend my home, on the vaccines I do and do not want. Um, you know, I was in the military, so I'm certainly not an anti-vaxxer, but I've chosen to not be vaccinated simply because there's 75 and 80 year olds out there that haven't been vaccinated. And this Marine refuses to stand and butt in line in front of anyone like that. And I will absolutely wait to be the last one as a leader of my community. That's what we did in the Marine Corps. Our colonels and our generals and our lieutenant colonels came out and fed us our food and the, and the lowest and the newest Marines ate first. And I'll never forget that. So as far as I'm concerned, I don't know anybody a damn thing as far as explanation on any of this. So, I mean, I, you know, I know Weibel had a bill, Delia Weibel had a bill too. I think it talks about this in a little bit more broader terms. Um, but that's just my feeling. I mean, you know, and I don't know. I don't know. It's just my two cents and that's, that's probably all it's worth, but there it is. No, oh, but I wanted to hear it. I wanted to see where, where we're and, and quite frankly, colleagues, I feel that way about you. You guys don't owe me an explanation on the car you drive or the money you spend on. I don't know where some of this kind of comes from in this country anymore, where I owe someone an explanation on the on the gun I buy or the car I drive or the, the money I spend on X, Y, Z or don't spend on something. I don't owe anybody a damn thing. And neither does anybody in this committee in my household or any of your households, you, you, you decide, you know, and that's just the way I feel about it. And that's the way I feel about it for everybody. And like I said, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. Does this vaccine freak me out? Yeah, it does a little bit, quite frankly. I'm, I'm old enough to remember, and I wasn't in the first desert storm, but I'm old enough to remember all those guys taking those pills and then them dying off. And then our beloved federal government wait until a large percentage of those people that did get sick from that died off. And then they went, Oh yeah, that's right. That, Oh, that whole Gulf war syndrome, it is real. And that's just the truth. And I, you know, I'm not black. I don't know what it's like to be, but, but I totally understand where uh, at least uh, from a small viewpoint of being in the military of uh, where a minority would feel coming from this. I mean, I certainly was a minority in many, many aspects of the military. And I spent almost a decade in the military and went to MacArthur Middle in, in Meade Village. I was certainly a minority. So I, I, I'm not going to profess to say what I, I, you know, I know what it's like to live like that. But I certainly have lived at least for short term in that. And so I get that argument as well. I heard that argument being made in, in the committee hearing as well. And I, I totally at least to some small degree, I guess, relate to that, uh, you know, being a military member. And I just, so that's just my two cents. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for letting me speak. Yep. Uh, Delia Crosby. Oh, hell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Question for council. Would this apply to hospitals? Yes. Okay. And then I assume it also would apply to like, let's say a four person business where if the business owner has an underlying health condition and they got to come in, let's say they're manufacturing something, um, they couldn't require those employees in a small setting either. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Thanks. Delegate Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll try not to, to use as much foul language as my past colleague here, but uh, Delegate Howard was talking about joking by the way, but um, United States Army, it's called leading by the example or be the example. It's the NCO creed. And in a case, especially in the African-American community, we lead by example by taking the vaccine first because there is a horrifying tornado of misinformation out there about what the vaccine does. And one thing we know it does for sure, beyond stopping you from getting the symptoms, it limits the amount of time in which you can carry and transmit the vaccine. I have problems with this uh, um, the thought process. And as I said in the back, you know, in subcommittee or chairs meeting, I'm not doing anything to send out the, to continue this horrific nonsense that this vaccine is, you know, to kill people. I have a lot of my friends that refuse to take this vaccine because they think somehow this is targeting African-Americans, which is why I was the first in line to let them know that it's not going to kill us. We're not going to kill off our doctors and nurses first in any way. 
But more than that, we do this for schools. We do this for colleges. We make sure before you go to public school, you have to have some vaccinations because we want to make sure that this disease dies. I'm not going to do anything to ensure the prevalence of this disease or the misinformation that somehow this vaccine's out to get us. I don't like telling people what to do. But then again, at some point, we need to make sure we protect people in the medical field, our, citizens, our senior citizens' homes, our hospitals, because like I said, this doesn't just stop you from getting the symptoms. It also dramatically decreases the amount of time that you can be transmitting this virus. So for all those reasons, I am not gonna sit here and try and feed into that nonsense that this vaccine is gonna kill somebody and I'm not doing the anti-vaxxer thing. And again, we lead by the example in the military in the United States Army and we, lead, we step up first to take the vaccine. Thank you. Right. Let me go to some civilians or something here. Uh, <laughs> Delegate in Polaria. Hey, um, you know, I wish the CDC would give us straight answers from day one, but they don't. And uh, I'm not telling anybody that they shouldn't take this vaccine, but we do have HIPAA rights. And, um, you know, when, when I go to the doctor, if uh, I don't want to take that blood pressure medicine, I shouldn't have to go back to work and find out I'm going to lose my job as a police officer because I'm not providing them with my medical records on that. Uh, I don't take the, uh, the vaccine for the flu and never have, and I shouldn't, you know, what next? Are we gonna force that? And then I'm just gonna say, cause we don't know the answer. If anybody right here is gonna say they know the answers, they don't know the answers. So, you know, tell me what happened with Plumidify that women were told to take who were pregnant. And do we know what was gonna happen to it to after it happened? So, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with this vaccine. We don't know how long it's going to last. I mean, one day they say it's going to last a certain small period of time. Other days they say it's going to last a long period of time. Now they're saying that even though the vaccine it will help you fight, it doesn't mean it stop you from catching it. So this vaccine could say, I could take the vaccine. I could catch it, give it to you, but I'm not going to really have any effects from it because I got the vaccine. These are all coming from the CDC. They're not giving us straight answers on any of them. I wish they did. I don't know if I'm supposed to wear a mask, one mask, two masks, or three masks. You know, and that changes from day to day. So, and this is what comes from the CDC. So if they had a, a better straight answer, but at the end of the day, you know, when you join the U.S. Army, you sign a piece of paper that says, I don't have constitutional rights. I belong to you, the U.S. military. We haven't signed that paper. We do have constitutional rights and we shouldn't be forced that if we don't do what we're told by our employer, we're gonna lose our job. And I've already been in contact with people who have been told if they don't take the vaccine, they're gonna lose their job. I mean, it's really nice for a vaccine. It's only been around for a month or two. So, you know, with that, I believe this bill is very necessary to protect our constitutional rights and to protect the HIPAA laws that we've already stood up and supported. Thank you. Uh, I think Delegate Adams, I saw you next. Council, can you tell me what the bill does? I'm, I'm an owner of a business um, with, I don't know, 35 employees. What, what, what's this bill do or not? Do? The bill prohibits an employer from terminating an employee solely because the employee has refused to take the COVID vaccine. And then in turn, if an employee does not get the vaccine and gets COVID at work, the employee waives the right to sue the employer. So and then that terminates at the end of 2023. It, all right. And so my follow-up is at what point is me as an employer with HIPAA laws where they are, would I ever find out whether somebody did or did not get a vaccine? I am certainly not the expert on HIPAA laws. I, I would have to check, you know, how that would work. I don't know if it's self-reported. You know, I, I, mean, I, I don't, I don't know. I just, okay. That, and, and I think that's the right answer. Um, you know, as an employer, it's none of my business what happens in a person's healthcare situation. Now there may be jobs out there. So, so Mr. Chairman, I'm giving my two cents. Yep. Nope. That's, that's what I wanted. So as a, as a, as a business owner, I've got no business um, weighing in on what, uh, what people do with their healthcare. Uh, now in my line of work, uh, which would be unlike, say, healthcare, for example. Maybe there are other job descriptions that uh, 
would require a different level of um, action when it comes to vaccines. But uh, I, I would stand with the rights of the employee to not disclose to me as an employer what they do or don't do with their health care. Thank you. Delegate Charcutian, did I see your hand or, or did you? Okay. Uh, Delegate Walker. Ooh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I appreciate this conversation, as scary as it may be to hear some, some of the comments I'm hearing uh, regarding the science. But uh, since this is an open debate, it's like, you know, when, when you're on a team, you know, you can only be as good as your weakest link. And if you've got a team of whether it's just a team of 10 and one person is being negligent about taking something serious, it can affect the whole team. And then you're talking about 10 people out over something that could be preventable. There's certain instances where you're talking about convalescent homes. If I, my grandmother or aunt or somebody was going into a convalescent home, I would want to feel confident to know that that person was vaccinated. And if they weren't vaccinated, uh, you know, then it's like, I don't want them bringing exposure to my aunt that got there. And I hope she got the shot, but let's suppose she's on the list to get the shot. We know there's a wait list to get the shot. They're having some trouble with the distributions of the shot. So it's uh it's going with the you know like stick with the with some of the science. Uh, what do they say? An ounce of prevention is always better than a pound of the cure. Who's not sticking with the science? That's right. who, who, of the who? cure. Excuse me, Delegate Howard. I'll debate. Who's you. not sticking? Hold with on, the gentlemen, science. gentlemen, gentlemen. I don't understand where these comments are coming from. The, like these because hold science. on, hold on, hold uh, on, everybody. Uh, let let. I agree on. with you, but you said that we're saying that wild comments and outside of the science. I, I don't understand where you're coming off. Well, I just heard somebody uh, somebody from your party say that uh, what the CDC is saying, which is a leading research technology out there in America, is saying this. They question everything that CDC was saying. They're saying it's this. They're saying it's that. They it's say different things. No, they say all right, it's been all right, all right, hold on, hold on. It's been consistent and since the beginning. Hold on. This is something that can be said. Hold on. Thank you. This, Sorry. You know what? Uh, let me hear from Delegate Chi, Delegate Jackson, and then I'm we're going to lose my time on the floor, Mr. Submit. Chair. All right. No, I said after you're finished, oh, then I'm going to okay. hear from them, and then we'll send it to subcommittee. So although, you know, when we say it, the thing that's been consistent is mask help prevent some things. That's been consistent throughout, and that's been questioned. So I'm just going back to the last thing I said. If you've got an opportunity to help save lives, prevent lives. And if I'm an employer, I think I owe it to the rest of my employees. I have a friend of mine who's got a dental practice and one of his employees caught COVID, came into the office, and then the coworkers had to go home for contact tracing for 14 days because this one employee caught COVID. And what's, what are the rest of them to do? Don't you, have a, don't you have an obligation to try and protect your employees, your teammates, your platoon, your citizen, your constituents, to the best of your ability. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, Delegate Chi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question. I'm reading uh, the Hosp Maryland Hospital Association's letter, um, which seem to be, seems to be saying that currently the hospitals are not uh, contemplating mandating vaccines. Uh, they have concerns with the length of this prohibition under this bill, which would prohibit an employer from mandating an employee uh, to take vaccination for a period of two years. I wonder if this issue came up, uh, is there any amendment in place if this issue is being addressed? That's my question. Thank you. Delegate Chi, I just got to the hospital association's testimony. It was the back of my file. Can you repeat your question for me? Yeah, because they raised the concern uh, that this bill as drafted, uh, as written, would prohibit an employer from mandating vaccination uh, for COVID-19 for up to two years. Um, so that's their con the concern, which is the length of that. Um, so I just wonder if this has been debated and considered. That, that's my question. Thanks. I know the, the proponents and the sponsor said at the hearing that the I guess the final studies on the current vaccines that are being administered would be done by the end of, I guess, 2023. So the argument that they made was, let's give our employees time to see the full studies because right now they're 
the vaccines are being administered based on the emergency use authorization. So um, the bill, you know, had that sort of sunset to allow employees to have more time, but then it would go away. Um, that's not to say that addresses your concerns, but that's just the, that's the argument that the proponents and the sponsor made. Uh, Delegate Jackson. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, just two things for me. Um, my first concern is how would one prove that they actually received the vaccine? I mean, we, we all have the blue cards, I guess, but if you were to lose that, how is there a way to get a copy of it or like how would that work? Probably the, I would think the health department um, could probably reissue that. Okay, okay. And then the second thing, if the vaccine, from my understanding, the vaccine is to protect the person who received the shot um, from dying from COVID, but you still can get COVID but maybe not, a, it'll be a lesser effect on you. Um, so I, I, I kind of like the portion of this bill that kind of um, lets, you know, kind of protect. Oh, Delegate Jackson, you're on mute. That's fine. Sorry, but I don't know what you heard. We heard you say you kind of like the part of the bill and then it cut out. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I like the part of the bill that protects the employer um, because if the vaccine, I guess if you make the choice to take the vaccine and protect yourself, you're also making the choice not to take the vaccine and not to protect yourself. And I don't think that an employer should be held accountable if a person chooses not to take the vaccine and protect themselves. So that's just my two cents. Uh, Delegate Pippi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Look, I mean, there's there's been some good points uh, across the board here. Um, you know, we talk about HIPAA. We talk about, you know, preventing the spread of, uh, you know, a, a deadly virus. Uh, I think they're all valid. I just had one. You know, the, the bill doesn't say, and I don't know if this is throwing a wrench in it, but that let's say this bill were to pass and an employer was able to offer vaccines and certain employees decided they, they didn't want to get it. And then that employee contracted the virus, came to work and spread it to a bunch of others. The bill doesn't suggest that the employer couldn't sue that employee for, for spreading the virus at work, does it? There's nothing in the bill that speaks to that. But I mean, it's, it's interesting because the bill speaks to the fact that an employee who contracted it couldn't sue, but it doesn't suggest that the employer couldn't sue that employee that refused the vaccine and then spread it to everybody else. I just okay. thought that was interesting for some reason. But I don't know if that helps anybody. It probably doesn't, but thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Delegate Watson. I wanted to add to Delegate Pippi that, Delegate Pippi's statements that the, the other issue is that employers are not immune from litigation if employees, they do something to have other employees get COVID, right? So I think there's a lot of issues here that um, need to be hashed out. In other words, if someone didn't take the vaccine and they couldn't be fired and then they spread it to employees, could those employees then sue the employer? because there's no protection for the employer. Yeah, all right. I think we have enough. We will definitely send that to subcommittee for a, a bit more flash, fleshing out and- Which subcommittee is that, Mr. Chair? Huh? Which subcommittee is that? Yes. Which subcommittee is that? I say it, yes. He's in the army, Mr. <laughs> Chair. You're going to have to lay it out for him. Hilarious. It, it sounds like a business regulation to me. Oh, sure wow. does. Sure oh, does. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah, no thank no. you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> the big consumer that protection. Should be mistaken. <laughs> that should go to UI because you're unemployed if you don't take it. Mm -hmm. De definitely Come business on, regs. Man. Definitely business regs. So oh, that's no. No, no, no. So we're showing that as held, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Reg doesn't have enough to do anyway, so.
Put, 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 Veronica, put Veronica Turner down as floor leader on that bill. All CT right. Lock, let's, let's CT Lock, to, I'll keep us straight. Let's go on 1196, guys. Okay. House Bill 1196 restructures and expands the Reverse Mortgage Loans Act. Uh, the bill will remove the requirement that reverse mortgage products made in Maryland have to comply with the Federal Housing Administration's Home Equity Conversion Mortgage Program, uh, lowers the age of a borrower to be 60, removes the maximum loan limits, and allows seniors that live in certain condos to obtain a reverse mortgage in Maryland. There are no amendments to this bill. Based on some discussions, I would move unfavorable. Well, hold on. Oh, okay, yeah. Right. I'm just making a motion. You can second. Can I, we're still going to talk on it. Delegate Howard. Well, I, I think the Senate is working out some amendments on this bill. So I, was I just, haven't seen any amendments. Well, the, I, again, I heard the Senate is working out some amendments on this bill on their side. I would just ask we hold hold it to the next voting session to see if there's any anything mm -hmm. tangible from the Senate. That's fine with me, but... That's that's fine. Uh, that's fine. Delegate. Thank you. Delegate Aarons. I, I was just going to. I'm good. I'm sorry. I had my hand up for the wrong reason. OK. Sorry. Done that before. Um, we'll hold that one as well. Let's go to 1213. A House Bill 1213 requires certain entities to consider alternative methods of evaluating the credit worthiness of an applicant when determining whether to accept an application for a primary residential mortgage loan or an extension of credit. Um, there is one amendment from the sponsor. Um, the amendments add a community development financial institution to the list of applicable entities, require that all entities subject to this requirement still adhere to federal rules concerning evaluations of applications and make stylistic changes. This um, was referred to the Banking and Consumer Protection Subcommittee and received a favorable with amendments um, recommendation. Move the amendments. Is there a second? All right. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. Move the bill as amended. Second. Discussion? Could someone tell me what the bill does real quick? I, wait, wait a minute. That, that's, not, that's not, Mr. Chairman, that's not the right question. Um, is, is this bill supported by the um, um, uh, the banks? Yes, so the amendments um, were all worked out by um, Delegate Queen, the Maryland Bankers Association, okay. the Maryland DC Credit Union, and then um, there was one more, I cannot remember which one, but they all worked on these amendments together and they um, testified at the subcommittee hearing that they were in support of the amendments and thus the bill. All right, thank you. Amendment. All right, thank you, Chairman. Delegate Aaron. Yeah, I think I was on that same thing because what I read in the bill in the uh, their, their complaint was the fact that if you give me more criteria to judge you on a loan and I don't get that, that could probably give you an unintended consequence to to skip away from the loan if you didn't have it. You're saying they worked that out in the subcommittee? Correct. So basically um, things like school attendance, mm -hmm. they're not gonna be able to get that information if someone doesn't give it to them. So it's put, mm -hmm. it, part of the amendment is if the applicant gives it to the bank, then they have to take that information into consideration. Okay, thank you very much. Delegate Mouts. I was just going to share, I think I was initially opposed to the bill and I was actually going to vote against the bill and, and the banks were even coming and saying they were supporting the bill and I was still going to vote against the bill and they explained how this, uh, how this works out and it works out in the benefit in a sound way and, and I changed, I voted for it in subcommittee and I'll be happy to vote for it today. I think we'll end there. Uh, there was a motion for favorable and a second. Mm -hmm. Did we adopt the amendment already? We did. All right. So it's moved and seconded, favorable as amended. Does anyone wish to be recording the opposition? Uh, Delegate DeMay? Yes. Delegate Brooks? Yes. Delegate Fisher? Delegate Fisher is excused. Delegate Queen. Yes. Delegate Turner. 
Yes. Delegate Rogers. Yes. Delegate Carey. Yes. Delegate Jackson. Yes. Delegate Pippi. Yes. Delegate Mouts. Yes. Delegate Wilson. Yes, Mr. Chair. Delegate Impolaria. Yes. Delegate Branch. Aye. Delegate Valderrama. Aye. Delegate Walker. Delegate Walker. <laughs> Is he there? I don't see him. All right, Delegate Walker is excused. Delegate Chi? Yes. Delegate Adams? Yes. Delegate Arendt? Yes. Delegate Fennell? Yes. Delegate Charcutian? Yes. Delegate Howard? Yes. Delegate Crosby? Yes. And Delegate Watson? Yes. Uh, motion carries. Mm -hmm. Uh, Delegate Conaway. I mean, House. yeah, Delegate House Bill 1225. I mean, 1225. House Bill 1225. House Bill 1225 requires a business that must file a sales and use tax return to account for it and pay to the comptroller with each return, the money not returned to customers during the national coin shortage. There were no amendments to this bill. Move unfavorable. Second. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded for an unfavorable on House Bill 1225, Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Delegate Brooks. Yes. Delegate Fisher. Is excused. Delegate Queen. Yes. Delegate Turner. Yes. Delegate Rogers. Yes, on the unfavorable. Dele Delegate Carey. Yes. Delegate Jackson. Yes. Delegate Pippi. Yes. Delegate Mouts. Yes. Delegate Wilson. Yes. Delegate Impolaria. No, Chairman, you moved too fast. I'm going to give my two cents on this bill. So that was uh, awful, Delegate yes. Impolaria. Yes. Yes. Uh, Delegate Branch. Yes. Delegate Valderrama. Aye. Delegate Walker is excused. Delegate Chi? Yes. Delegate Adams? Yes. Delegate Arendt? Yes. Delegate Fennell? Yes. Delegate Charcutian? Yes. Delegate Howard? Yes. Delegate Crosby? Yes. Delegate Watson? Yes. And Carries. Uh, House Bill 1235. House Bill 1235 was referred to the Banking and Consumer Protection Subcommittee and it received a, a recommendation of unfavorable. Do you want me to go into details? Uh, no, uh, Delegate Brooks, do you want to roll call or do you want to withdraw? I just want to withdraw that, Mr. Chair. Okay. Been moved. Is there a second for the uh, withdrawal? Second. All right, Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Delegate Brooks. Yes. Delegate Fisher's excused. Delegate Queen. Yes. Delegate Turner. Yes. Delegate Rogers. Yes. Delegate Carey. Yes. Delegate Jackson. Yes. Delegate Pippi. Yes. Delegate Mouts. Yes. Delegate Wilson. Yes. Delegate Impolaria. Yes. Yes. Delegate Branch. Yes. Delegate Valderrama. I. Uh, Delegate Walker. Yeah. Yes. Delegate Walker is excused. Delegate Chi. Yes. Delegate Adams? Yes. Delegate Arendt? Yes. Delegate Fennell? Yes. Delegate Charcutian? Yes. Delegate Howard? Yes. Delegate Crosby? Yes. 
Delegate Watson? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, House Bill 1274. House Bill 1274 requires a retail seller to disclose the raised price of a consumer commodity if the total or unit price is raised. There are no amendments to this bill. Move unfavorable. Second. Moved and seconded for an unfavorable. Uh, were you trying to talk on this, Delegate Mounts? Okay. Uh, Madam Vice Chair? Yes. Delegate Brooks? Aye. Delegate Fisher is excused. Delegate Queen? Yes. Delegate Turner? Yes. Delegate Rogers? Yes. Delegate Carey? Yes. Delegate Jackson? Yes. Delegate Pippi? Yes. Delegate Mout? Yes. Delegate Wilson? Yes. Delegate Impolaria? Yes. Delegate Branch? Yes. Delegate Valderrama? Aye. Delegate uh, Walker is still excused? Aye, uh, I'm here. Aye, I, I D. I'm here. Aye. Uh, Delegate Chi? Yes. Delegate Adams? Yes. Delegate Arents? Aye. Delegate Fennell? Yes. Delegate Charcutian? Yes. Delegate Howard? Yes. Delegate Crosby? Yes. Delegate Watson? Yes. Uh, the motion carries. Mm -hmm. uh, House Bill 1275. House Bill 1275 is the only bill referred to PNC so far this year. Uh, it was taken up at its subcommittee meeting last week. They had hoped to hold it. There was a letter sent by uh, Senator Pinsky on a cross file to the House bill in ways and means that gave rise to this. Uh, but it was decided, I think, that ultimately the uh, subcommittee would be sending a letter out instead. That is correct. And just, I did um, text back and forth with the um, sponsor, Delegate Lazanti, over the weekend. Mm -hmm. And she does want to withdraw it. I had asked if she'd have something to the committee by 4.30 today. I assume not since it's on the list, but she does want to withdraw it. So I don't know if you want to just wait and I'll follow up with her. Or... I'll, I'll take your word for it, Madam Vice Chair. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I have the text messages, so she does want to withdraw it. So is that being handled as a withdrawn by sponsor? Yes. Okay. CT, is the text message count as evidence in court to be admissible? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, I can't tell you how many stupid text messages I read in family law cases. Especially family law, <laughs> right. <laughs> hmm. I thought I saw that on Law and Order once. Uh, I don't know. Um, all right, uh, House Bill, that's, that's 74, 75. 75. 75. Right, I think I'm awful here, so... 74 was a Conaway bill. Okay. 1275. Um, That's the word withdrawing. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Does any, let me do it this way. Since Delegate Fisher is the only one that's excused, um, does anyone wish to vote against the withdrawing? If not, all others present voted aye. Delegate Fisher is excused. Uh, House Bill 1294. House Bill 1294 requires any business or retail establishment that has a touch screen to use by a customer to have hand sanitizer at each touch screen. There are no amendments to this bill. Mike, move unfavorable. Okay. Moved and seconded for Second. unfavorable for House Bill 1294. Does anyone wish to be recorded in opposition? Seeing none, hearing none, Delegate Fisher used. 
All others voted aye. Uh, House Bill 1321. This is the right to work bill that specifies that an employer may not require as a condition of employment or continued employment that an employee join or uh, remain. Say, council, save your breath on this one. I actually think I know the vote, but just for fun, I'm going to do a roll call anyway. In honor of Delegate Miller. <laughs> I was just move gonna, unfavorable. I was going to ask if we could call it the Warren Miller Act. Of 2021, yes, the Warren second. Please, please let them know we did that. <laughs> Act of 2021. Um, I believe there's a motion for an unfavorable in a second. Um, let me see how this works out, Madam Vice Chair. Yes, Delegate Brooks. Aye on unfavorable. Delegate Fisher's excused. Delegate Queen. Yes. Delegate Turner. Yes. Delegate Rogers. Yes. Delegate Carey. Yes. Delegate Jackson. Yes. Delegate Pippi. No. All right. This is where it starts to turn. No. Delegate Wilson. Yes. Delegate Impolaria. No. Delegate Branch. Yes. Delegate Valderrama. In honor of Dear Womp, yes, on the unfavorable. <laughs> Delegate Walker. Yeah, I'll do. I'll, I'll... <sighs> nah. No. You're voting no? Yeah, I'm voting no. Oh. You're screwing up his totals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good thing I count. You have to watch him, though. Like it yeah, always. Delegate Chi uh, on the hey, let me change that, motion. Derek. Uh, Mr. Yeah, Chair, let me change that. Uh, I'll vote. A card I'll vote. laid is a card laid. Card laid. Card laid. Card laid. <laughs> no, no. Fortunately, we <laughs> hadn't gone to the next person just yet. Uh, Delegate Chi. Yes. Delegate Adams. <laughs> uh, I, I, so I oppose the unfavorable. I just want to make sure. So I'm no. Yes. Thank you. Delegate Aarons? No. Delegate Fennell? Yes, on the unfavorable. <laughs> Delegate Charcutian? Yes, on the unfavorable. Delegate Howard? No. Delegate Crosby? Yes. And Delegate Watson? Yes. Shocking. 16601? Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh... House Bill 653 is a withdrawn. Mm -hmm. uh, Fisher's excused. Anyone? Up? Well, I guess I need a motion. Uh, uh, move uh, unfavorable on the with as withdrawn. Second. And, and a second. Does anyone wish to be recording opposition to the motion? Seeing none. All present voted aye. One excused. That's Delegate Fisher. Unless I'm missing a page, I believe that's the list. That's the list, sir. Um, guys, we don't have any hearings this week. However, um, there there should be subcommittee meetings. I, I know. I believe there's at least one each day, um, and more could be added. So. Keep an eye on your email. Also, voting sessions will be added. Uh, do we have one scheduled for Wednesday? Not yet. No. All right. We'll, we'll see where that falls. It'll either be Wednesday or Thursday, I'm sure. Um, it's just a matter of, of when we can get the work done and, and, and ready to go. So it, we, we have to do a little bit of this, a little formally. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we're going to do double sessions uh, a few times this week. So we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get in where we fit in, as they say. And with that, thank you all very much. Have a good evening and I will see you all tomorrow.